we all know this bit of a scheme. Um, rich people, quote unquote, successful people and whatnot are reading books. They do not use social media um, or whatever. You know, these Instagram posts and or whatever social media posts are suggesting that successful people are doing. But uh, the, the whole book reading thing might be the case. Um, I don't really know and I have stated my opinion on reading books and or books as a medium in general before. Uh, I think information is information whether you're gathering it from a book or otherwise, um, whether it is actually a printed book or an e-book. I think it really comes up also to your preferences, to your personal preferences, what you like, what you dislike, whatnot, how you can learn, how you do learn and so on and so forth. So, uh, period, quite. Still, I find it pretty interesting what certain people are reading, and so I have looked up articles by Tim Ferriss once again. Tim Ferriss, the author of several books, and uh, also the podcast host of The Tim Ferriss Show, which is an amazingly great podcast, at least at my point of view, since he's covering so many different topics and he has been interviewing so many different people from different, um, well, also stages of life, but also from, you know, uh, different industries. This person is doing that. The other person is doing something completely different. But still, they all are very, well, useful might be the wrong word, but useful for gathering information and also gathering, um, as Tim also himself states, often uh, just for insight you know this is one of the reasons why he started a podcast you know also for personal gain and to ask certain people about certain things that he would like to know more about my favorite and most impactful reads from 2021 this article is from january the 7th 2022 and also by tim ferris there is also a video linked how to remember what you read and how i digest books by Tim Ferriss, which is a bit of a series around um, him doing things and him showing how to do things and how he does things. The below description originally appeared in my free newsletter, Five Bullet Friday, which I send out every Friday. It is a short email of bullet points that describe the five coolest things I have found or explored each week. Five Bullet Friday often includes books, gadgets, quotes, experimental supplements and useful stuff from all over the world to sign up and join 1.5 plus million other subscribers, please click here. It is easy to unsubscribe anytime. If your inbox, as, as mine is, is already so full, uh, full of shit actually, that you do not really wanna have more of whatever. My favorite and most impactful reads from 2021. Uh, as far as I do know, and uh, it's, it's a rather long list, so I do not really know if I'm going to go through all of it or if I'm going to read all of it. But um, as far as I remember, Ferris said that in recent years, he's not going to read very new books, you know, books published in this certain year. I think this was the rule. Um, I mean, for several reasons, if I remember correctly, one of it being there are so many books released uh Catching up with it, I guess, is pretty difficult and uh, might also be about quality. I don't really know. But let's have a look. Uh, the Art of Seeing Things essay by John Burroughs. It's B U R R O U G H S, edited by Charlotte Zoe Walker. How do you sharpen the eye and mind? How can you more fully experience the vibrant details of nature? He writes beautifully on these and many other topics. He can be heavy on the bird references but the essay that is the namesake of this volume the art of seeing things is simply outstanding so um <laughs> i might actually be going through that if i can find it somewhere else what i'm reading i'm sorry uh the first you know uh, subtitle sub headline was what i am reading longer week of december 20 uh 28th 2020 then we have week of December 28th, 2020, what I am reading shorter. Okay. Um, 
100 Tips for a Better Life by Connor Barnes. This is a surprisingly good list despite the generic headline. Thanks to Ryan Holiday for the recommendation. What I am reading longer uh, in the week of January the 4th of Wolves and Men by Barry Lopez. This is probably my favorite non-fiction book of the last five years. I received it as a Christmas gift. I devoured it in one week and nearly every page is covered in highlighter. It's truly that phenomenal Barry's mastery of structure and the writing where it echoes of John McPhee and the beauty of his prose reminds me of Mary Oliver. Repeatedly I found myself saying aloud, wow, how does someone do this? Here's the description edited for length. Humankind's relationship with the wolf is the sum of a spectrum of responses ranging from fear to admiration and affection. Lopez's classic careful study won praise from a wide range of reviews, became a fanlist for the National Book Award and forever improved the way books on wild animals are written. Of Wolves and Men explores the uneasy interaction between wolves and civilization over the centuries and the wolves' prominence in our thoughts about wild creatures. And so on and so forth. There's a bit more to it, but um, because of its length, I am also going to shorten it. What am I reading? So apparently uh, he is reading not every week, maybe every week, I don't want to do the math, but a shorter one and a longer one. The shorter one in the week of January the 4th is What is Death? Sunday, Sunday New York Times by B.J. Miller. Uh, Dr. B.J. Miller has helped more than a thousand people to die. He is a hospice and palliative medicine physician as well as author of Beginner's Guides to the End, Practical Advice for Living Life and Facing Death. Um, Ferris very recently, I think it was the podcast episode from either yesterday or or a few days before, um, he said that B.J. Miller might have been one of the uh, most impactful, if I remember correctly, please take it with a grain of salt, but might be one of the most impactful uh, podcast, how do you say, like a podcast guest, yes, um, that he's had uh, quite ever, I think. Uh, and it's it's a very interesting story. It's a very interesting thing. Um, being in a hospice, I guess it's called, and palliative medicine and whatnot. You know, always facing death, always having to deal with it. I think it's, it's, it's you know, quite a bit. A uh, book I am reading in the week of January the 18th, Art is the Highest Form of Hope. Special thanks to the amazing Susan Jane for sending this beautiful book to me, which is full of bite-sized philosophy and much-needed imagination. These days, a little light goes a long way. From the description, advice, strong opinions, and personal revelations by the world's greatest artists, exclusively researched for this new book. Sounds actually very great, I'm not gonna lie. Um, Essay I'm reading, Still Alive by Scott Siskin, better known as Scott Alexander. This really struck a chord, and if you are considering growing your audience or platform, make this essay part of your required reading. This bullet will be a little longer and more heated than usual as it reopened old wounds. Should I read it? There is a lot more to it. And I think also as well, uh, in general, I would have to really, uh, you know, cut it down into several pieces. This whole article, I think it is still very useful and very interesting, first of all, to see uh, why he is going through certain things, um, which I don't know if he will state that but I think in in context one can imagine first of all this second of all just getting the uh, um, you know knowing about those people because most of these people I just don't know um, so this is a great thing third of all for me knowing what book I am going through next what book summary I'm going through next I should rather say um, and uh, yeah, I think it is very useful and it is very bite-sized. Uh, also, topics that I have never thought about. The whole wolf thing, I have never thought about that. I have never thought about uh, wolves and their relationship to civilization and vice versa. Of course, uh, uh, in Austria at least, it is... I don't want to say it's common, but in, in recent times there have been certain wolf uh, killing sheep and whatnot and there is a bit of a controversy should we kill those wolves uh shouldn't we should we do it in in, in another way and, and so on and so forth so a bit of a controversy there and a bit of a thing here um but still i think that it is interesting and also very useful 
to go through that list and read through that list just to see what people are thinking and uh, period. I indeed want to read this little essay to you. Some of my dear friends are journalists and they are wonderful people. They measure twice and cut once. They are thoughtful, unrushed and considerate despite or, uh, organizational pressure and incentives to be the opposite. That takes extraordinary discipline and it's fucking hard. It isn't the path of least resistance and I admire the hell out of them for doing what is right despite the uphill path. This includes some amazing humans at the New York Times. This praise... I think New York Times. This praise doesn't mean that they write fluff pieces. It means they aim to be fair and humane and take the time necessary to think about ethics and the golden rule, which is linked here. As another article, I think. That said, there is a great, too terrible spectrum for any professional group, including surgeons, elementary school teachers, politicians, hot dog vendors, and yes, even journalists. There are people in all walks of life who are spiteful, narcissistic, harried, or simply uncaring. They do what is easiest and best for them personally, and what is expedient, without thought to those vulnerable to their mistreatment. Perhaps it is from fatigue, perhaps it is from outside pressure, perhaps it is from ill will, but the outcomes are often the same. Sadly, there are journalists who earn a living by repeatedly earning trust and betraying it. They are a minority, but they clearly exist. I don't say this about anyone, referred to in Scott's essay, as I am not in the know, but based on my personal experience with hundreds of interviews over 10 plus years, plus other authors' similar experiences, there are great people in the unlikeliest of places and there are bad apples at even the best publications. Don't assume a good must head means you are in safe hands. Which is, I mean, I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't understand that you would... Um, I mean, uh, one could also say it's uh, it's how those people view the world. It's how those people interpret whatever they are uh, talking about, whatever they are doing, whatever, whatever. Um, but still, I think it is always best to do the best you can to make it work for... Uh, you know, make it work in terms of, you know, being right, saying saying the truth. And um, when you're not quite sure and when you feel like this is your truth, stating that in some way or another, journalists are great write writers, they for sure can put it, in, put, put it into such words that people are not being confused and people are not being um, misguided, you know, that this is the case and this isn't and so on and so forth. This entire essay by Scott can serve as a cautionary tale about public exposure, fame, privacy and living life. The don't kick me in the ball section speaks to deeper truths and risks of the spotlight. Personally, I've been misquoted by tier 1 newspapers and even treated by one writer at the newspaper of record. Why was it treated? Uh, I'm sorry, I by tier one newspaper even threatened, I'm sorry, by one writer at the newspaper of record. Uh, why was I threatened? Because I asked that he only include my answers if he quoted them in full instead of pulling single sound bites out of context, which he had done before. This was for an online piece, so there were no space constraints. He got very upset and wrote directly, you are not in control, and proceeded to explain the, de and ex explain the power dynamic <laughs> and during a uh, I immediately saved and drafted that exchange as a just-in-case blog post, which I still have, thankfully. I didn't need it uh, then, and I can only guess that he realized the liability of explicitly typing what he did. That is an edge case. There are tougher cases that don't leave as obvious a paper trail. For example, I've had fact-checkers at the magazine famous for fact-checking not make the corrections I provided via phone, which resulted in a grossly inaccurate profile that will sit in a Google result for years and probably decades. Lesson learned, only do fact-checking via email. For these reasons and more, I rarely do print interviews any longer, and if I do, I use email or insist on also having recordings of the conversations. Pro tip, ensure you ask to record on your sites and have your own audio via Skype, QuickTime, Zoom, or others. As I've also 
uh, had several writers promise to send their audio and then never do. So despite multiple follow-ups, as Mike Shinoda says in Fort Minus, get me gone. After that, I made it a rule, and this is a quote, by the way, I only do email responses to print interviews because these people love to put a twist to your words to infer that you said something fucking absurd. Now I've got the interviews on file, which people said what, which number to dial. Again, in the world of media, as in any group of humans, there are the good, the bad, and the ugly. There are some beautiful humans and some de plorable humans and a vast majority fall somewhere in between. <laughs> Depending on which side of the bed they woke up, plan accordingly and if you want more scary bedtime stories alongside some tactical points, consider reading 11 reasons not to become famous. <laughs> Fame, even micro-celebrity, is like a razor sharp scalpel with no handle. It is easily cuts. It easily cuts both ways. Just for the hell of it, it turns the above bullet into a short blog post here. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know, I, in my quote-unquote professional life as a designer, I have also unfortunately uh, come by certain things that I guess I could have prevented. I mean, uh, money, not, you know, not receiving some money and, and, and whatever, I just, you know, really waiting for money for quite a bit of time and, uh, I don't know, it, it is a fucked up thing and it once again really uh, underlines what I've said before. I believe that doing the right thing is always going to be, first of all, the, the easiest for you. I I don't want to say that nobody is, has ever forgotten anything. You know, I've also forgotten things, you know, but this is not the thing. Uh, doing the right thing is always going to be the right thing and it is always also going to be uh, useful and what is best for you in the long term, at least at my point of view. Also, uh, quote unquote, legacy wise, whatever. Uh, the week of January 25th, meet the 19 year old from Kazakhstan who m remixed Roses into a hit. Sometimes it seems impossible to beat the odds, and sometimes the ruts seem to deeply duck. But when you come across someone like uh, Iman Beck, Saikonov, you gain a little hope in your step and a little optimism in your spirit from the New York Times. Iman Beck Saikonov, which is C or sad, E I K E N O V, is a 19 year old and lives with his parents in a small village of Aksu in Kazakhstan. He studied railway engineering at school and until last December held a day job at his local train station, but everything changed in the summer when he discovered a song called Roses by blah blah blah. Uh, whatever. <laughs> That's good. Week of February the 8th. Ketamine. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. Ketamine. Ketamine. Whatever. For depression. What the treatment reveals about the brain by Lauren Tinap. There is also a podcast episode. I don't want to say entirely about it, but um, a lot about it. Then the long read of the same week about this life journeys on the Threshold of Memory by Barry Lopez. Um, I would suggest reading of Wolves and Men, which was the wolf thing before, or Arctic Dreams first, as they are non-fiction at its best. About this life is a mostly autobiographical collection of essays in descending order. My favorites thus far are Learning to See, Orchids on the Volcanoes, and Apologia. Apologia? A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A. 19 minutes and I think I'm gonna end the episode here. I hope that I've been able to share certain things uh, that you want to go through yourself, that you find interesting yourself, um, and I am hopefully gonna see you the next time. So, bye-bye.